Kia ora e Hey, it is so good to have you join us today. Very soon we're going to hear from one of our team, but before we do, we're going to have some worship. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you're doing in our church. We adore you, we love you, and we're here to lift you up. Let's worship.
O oh, kia ora koutou katoa, ko Jackie, toka ingoa, and ngā mahi nui ki a koutou tēnei rā. Really happy to be here sharing with you, and you know, God is on the move. And I just feel that he's breaking into some of your worlds right now. And boy, some of us really need to see a breakthrough. 
So I just encourage you that God sees you in the midst of wherever you are. And he's reaching out to you as you can reach out to him. So Jesus, we reach out to you now. Pray that you would be with us as we share together. Thank you that these people are just not nobodies. (laughs) There's somebody in you. I just believe to say that God knows who you are. He knows you and he sees you and he loves you and he's reaching out to you today to be established in his love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm really happy to be here to uh, share with you today. And as Ben said, I lead the School of Leadership and Theology, and that's been really quite fun this year. Um, Great. Yeah, we meet on Monday nights and uh, from November through to, sorry, not November, what's it called? March (laughs) through to November, (laughs) because we're in November now. Yeah, just get the months around the right way there. So March through to November, Monday nights. And, you know, um, I'm just really excited for what God is doing with this church and establishing people in Jesus and who they are in him and raising them up to have an impact to see kingdom breakthrough wherever you are, in your jobs, in your homes, in your communities, wherever God has you, he, is, he, he wants to be able to use you to see his kingdom break in. So I'm just really excited about that. Um, and we've got applications open now for the next year's cohort. You know, it might not be your year next year to do it because everything in its right time, hey, Um, But sometime, maybe, it might be great for you to come. And we have an open night once a term. So even if you didn't want to do the whole course, perhaps you might like to come along and join in with the open nights. You really would be so welcome. So, um, yep, it's busy times, Christmas time, hey, and, um, but the Lord is not interested so much in what we're doing, but who we are. And he is the I am. And so he is all about being... um, yeah. So I wanted to start off just by sharing a scripture from Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat on Christmas Day? <laughs> what shall we drink at our, new, at our Christmas Eve party? Or what shall we wear on Christmas Day? <laughs> I just added those bits, by the way. Just... <laughs> Yeah, fine. (laughs) Not that you can add to the Bible. Gosh, I'm really digging myself into a hole now. Um, Yeah, so let's keep on going. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Boy, don't we know it. (laughs) Each day has enough trouble as own, and we must keep our eyes on Jesus. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of those things will be added to us. You know, this time of year, it can just feel like you're bubbling along, head to the ground, just going. Um, but in these times, Jesus is inviting us to just stop and take a moment. <sighs> take a breath in him, and stand and respond to his love and look and see where he's moving. You know, every kingdom has a king, and we have King Jesus. He is our king, and he is king of kings, and he's lord of lords. His kingdom is breaking in, and we as his followers are designed to live lives of breakthrough. That's what he's designed for us, that we would break through, that his kingdom would break through into this present age that we live in, pushing back the powers of the enemy and bringing in the great, wonderful, glorious kingdom of God. And we have three ways that we look at the kingdom. First of all, the kingdom has broken in. You know, when Jesus came, you know, he was born, um, grew up. He died, rose again, went up to heaven, sent his Holy Spirit. Everything has been sorted out. His kingdom has come. It's it's great news for us. However, we still live in this world, and when we look around us, we don't see that kingdom all of the time, hey? But the fact of the matter is that Jesus has come, so his kingdom has come. The kingdom is breaking in as we go about living our life, and God's calling us to announce to everyone everywhere that Jesus is Lord. And just doing that through your normal day life, that's not forgetting about Jesus, but being with him and walking together through what you do. We're called to intervene as we're led by the Holy Spirit. 
to do and say things, to think things that are in line with God's word. And um, that's how we're intervening. We're called to participate in transformation. You know, your life isn't just for nothing. It's so that light and love would come into your life and you would be transformed by the love of God. And then you would step out as God leads you in your everyday life and you would be used by him to see his kingdom and his love break into those around you. And that we would step out in obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit because he's always nudging us. If only we'd have ears to hear it, hey, and eyes to see where he's moving. So, um, yeah, the kingdom is breaking in. And finally, the kingdom will break in, in its fullness when Jesus returns. There will be a day when Jesus comes back. Yeah. And at that point, every eye will see him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Even those people who have not previously thought that way. Yeah. Every eye will see and every tongue will confess. And many of the things that we don't understand in this present age will become revealed. Everything that is hidden, I just feel that God's speaking to some of you. Maybe you feel as if you're hidden and parts of your life are hidden. Sure, yes, parts might be hidden, but you are not hidden to God. And I just feel that he's reaching out to you right now. I think it's maybe someone down the back down there. You're not hidden to God and he's reaching out to you. If only you'd respond to his love. Um, so your life is big, part of this bigger picture. And, you know, life is busy. There's struggles can get us down. And um, just you can be head down looking at what's in front of you, trying to work out how you can get through. But God has something more for you. It's not trying to get through. It's being seated with him, loved, and looking to see how he's moving Paul prays that we might understand this wider kingdom perspective and that we would understand what it means to be seated in heavenly places with Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, this is his prayer for us. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything, over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So amazing, isn't it? Yeah, And not only is Jesus seated in those heavenly places, far above all power, role and authority, we go on to read that we are also seated with him in heavenly places. And that, friends, is our position for living our life. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And so this is where we live from, seated in heavenly realms with the Lord, looking to see how he's moving and wanting to respond to how the Holy Spirit is leading us. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and he's the end. And everything is created for him, in him, by him, through him. And that's what you are, you're created in God to do something in this world. And most of all, just to be loved by God. You know, in this time, we're waiting for the final breakthrough of the kingdom. And we look around us. Sometimes we see the kingdom breaking in. Sometimes we don't. It's like going through the longest night, this this present age that we live in. It's the longest night. And when Jesus returns, it's going to be like the sunrise of a new day, the beginning of a new era. We, We can hardly fathom it. Gosh, we're only trying to get our heads around life here let alone a whole eternity that's waiting for us. But it's the longest night 
and we're waiting for the sunrise. We get glimpses of Jesus returning. We get glimpses of Jesus breaking into our life in areas of pain and sickness and sadness. We get glimpses of it, but we don't see the fullness of it. And in the Word, it talks about this all the way through. Even in the Old Testament, God's people would be going along, things would be happening, not going so well. And it would be called the day of the Lord when the Lord breaks in to restore the people back to them, back to him. And that would be the day of the Lord. And the people would come back to him and then they'd go along a little bit more, things would get bad. <laughs> God would intervene, it would be the day of the Lord. And so we have all of these moments of the day of the Lord. You know, the day that you met Jesus, that you got an inkling that maybe he was true, was a day of the Lord in your life. You got a snippet of the breakthrough of God. Yeah? And... Um, we're looking for the fullness of that. We live in this present time, not seeing the full picture. Um, it's a little bit hazy in parts. We read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 to 12. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, that is when Jesus comes and returns, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, and when I became a man, I put away the childhood things behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So our life here, we, we see snippets of, of God's love. <laughs> Of course we can experience the fullness of it, but not in its entirety until Jesus returns. And so that's why it's important that we gather together and we encourage each other as the body. Because not any of us are perfect. And no one has the full picture. We must keep on looking to Jesus and gather together to encourage each other on his kingdom breaking in. It's as if we're a child for a really long time. <laughs> we haven't grown up. We haven't underst understood the things of our life that we're purposed for eternally um, until Jesus comes back. So in the vineyard, we talk about this as being like a picket fence. You get one paling, and then you've got a gap, and then you've got another paling, and then you've got a gap. And when you look at the fence, sometimes when you look at it, you just see the paling. And you think, oh, okay, is that all there is? The next time you look at the fence, you'll be able to see straight through into the age to come. Yeah? So we're living in this present age and the kingdom is breaking into this age. And when we look through that gap, we see Jesus and we see his love and we see him breaking into our situations. And the next minute we look at it, not sure. <laughs> no, pray for someone. Sometimes they're not healed. And then other times we pray for them and we see the kingdom burst again and they are healed. It shouldn't discourage us that we don't always see the kingdom breaking in. Because this life is not perfect. Yeah? So it's not an excuse for us to stop <laughs> praying for people, for us to stop seeing God come. We're becoming transformed by the love and the power of God. And as we are, we are changed from the inside out. The kingdom gets established on the inside of us. And then as we step out in God's love and his power, we get to see how the Holy Spirit's moving and follow his lead. And these are the things that we've been talking about this year in the School of Leadership and Theology. And we've been reading a book called Breakthrough by Derek Morphew. And I wanted to share a quote from the book and just a few thoughts. So here's the quote. <laughs> All those who have experienced the end of the, of the times in Jesus have been apprehended by the reign of God. They are subjects of one Lord. And we have seen that the church is created by the inbreaking of the kingdom of God as the power of the age to come breaks into this world. It creates a community of people who have experienced a transformation of their lives and loyalties. So wonderful how the kingdom's breaking in. And it's creating us into a people of breakthrough, a people of transformation. So when you met Jesus, you experienced the end of this age. You experienced Jesus being there, but you met him face to face. 
And it may not be like that every day that you walk through in this life, but you still experienced part of it. And as you spend time face to face with Jesus, you'll experience more of the day of the Lord when Jesus returns. And in the word, it talks about that we have received the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what our future is. And that's who the Holy Spirit is. He is a deposit in our life, guaranteeing a life with God. And we read about this um, in Ephesians chapter 1, and those words, deposit, guaranteeing, are the same words used for an engagement ring. And that's what the Holy Spirit is like. He's given to us as a deposit, guaranteeing our life with God in the future age. And so we're to live like there will be a marriage, there will be a wedding when Jesus returns, but until then, we are engaged. It's all promised that we haven't actually experienced the fullness of it yet. Yeah? Is that making sense? So um, in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 15, it says, And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the next point is we live in the world, uh, live in the kingdom, but also in the world. So we are like citizens of the kingdom living in a foreign country of the world. And so the world will not do things the way that our kingdom and our king does things. But we need to know that we are belonging in the kingdom, having an impact in the world where we are. The next point is the church has been created by the inbreaking of the kingdom. It's not as if a whole lot of people got together in a church and started talking about the kingdom and that's how the kingdom was created. No, the king and his kingdom are breaking into this world and we have experienced it because we've met Jesus. And so we come together to learn and encourage each other to grow in our faith and to go together in God. Um, as the church. We are people of breakthrough as we are transformed. Our lives and loyalties have been transformed. We are continually growing and becoming more and more like Jesus in how we think, feel, and choose. And, you know, you may think that sometimes you're waiting for God to tell you what to do, but God first is doing a work inside your heart of transforming you. And then what you do won't become a big thing it will just actually be who you are, arriving in a place at a time and seeing what God is doing and stepping in and doing that. You know, we participate in breakthrough as we learn to confront the powers of this age. And transformation is not possible without confrontation. Oh, gosh. <laughs> if you're someone that doesn't like confrontation, like I'm not you know, talking about necessarily confronting people. What I'm talking about is confronting the works of the enemy. We see them and we confront them. We see them for what, we are, what they are and we push them back in Jesus' name. We say that those things don't have a hold over us or this place or those people. And we pray that God's love would come and fill that place. God has intervened by sending Jesus into this present age and uh, it's the time right now for us to partner with him in intervening. God is calling you to intervene in your everyday world. Not necessarily by doing something, but by being someone in him. Just seeing what he's doing and joining in with him. You know, three things that I um, love to think about is I just go, okay, I'm loved by God. I'm seen, I'm known, and I'm loved by him. And uh, I can be established in his love. And that was, has been hard for me because I've come more from a performance mindset of needing to do things in order to find my identity. But we have the opportunity to know that we are loved just for who we are, not what we do. And so as we learn to understand and accept the Lord's love um, in areas that we were trying to hold control of, <laughs> we get to find out what his love really means and we are established in his love. 
And as we stand in him, our roots will go down. That will give us a place of security in him. And it won't be that what the world says about us. It won't be what our past says about us or the enemy says about us that will take us down. We actually get to stand in God and be who we are in him, regardless of the situation and the circumstances. And I just want to speak to people who have horrible situations and circumstances around them. This life has a lot of things in that we would rather not choose. And so just in the name of Jesus, I lift the responsibility of those things off your shoulders. And just agree with God that you would stand in him and in his love. That he would come and fill you. And he would do something that you are not able to do on your own. We are becoming led by the Holy Spirit as we look to his lead in moments that are less than ideal. We're becoming known as love as we show love towards others because we have received love from the Lord himself. And we are being strong to confront the works of the enemy, to recognise it for what it is and to push it to the side. And because we are established in love, we're secure in our identity, you are empowered for influence. Your life is not just for nothing. You're called to influence and to do something with your life. (laughs) Uh, You don't even have to try. Actually, you just give your life to Jesus and then step into what he's doing. (laughs) So if you just put a whole big heavy thing on you, just take it off because it's not a heavy thing in God. It actually is just being with him. We are ordinary people, but we're seeing the Lord move as we step out in him. Ordinary, imperfect people, honestly surrendering all of who we are to Jesus and looking to him to lead us by his spirit and to step out in his authority. So every one of you are called to be in relationship with Jesus and then you're called to do something wonderful to intervene in this world through your life situation, whether you're at home, at work, at school, whether you're exercising, whether you're shopping, whether you're thriving, whether you're struggling, Uh, you're called to be with God and to bring his kingdom. You know, the first place that I intervene is in not listening to the enemy. He has a lot of jealous chatter about me because he wants everything that I have. He's the one that wants to be seated in heavenly places, but he's not. I am. And so it's just recognising that jealous chatter for what it is, and pushing it to the side. And we read about this in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. It's talking about Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephron. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. But you have been brought down to the realm of the dead, into the depths of the pit. And that is the destiny for the enemy, yeah? And so I just, um, I just encourage those of you who have just that jealous chatter of the enemy, we just push that back in the name of Jesus. Because those words just come from a place of jealousy. And I just release each one of you to step into who you are in God, the beloved of him, called by him to be in relationship with him and to intervene in this world as you see his kingdom breaking in. From this place of knowing your identity and your authority, God is leading you to intervene in this present age. You might not know what to do, but as we develop a relationship of trust with God, when we see God is on something or highlighting something to us, you know, it may be the way that a situation seems or just a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Um, It might be a bodily sensation. It might be just something to let you know that God is on the move and you're to take notice and you're to step out as you see the Holy Spirit leading you. And I ask myself these questions, maybe they might be helpful for you. When I'm in a situation, I use my imagination. And I imagine, Jesus, if you walked into this room, what would you do and what would you say? I want to imagine your kingdom coming here. What does it look like? Show me what it looks like. Give me eyes to see it, ears to hear it, and a willing heart to step into it. I ask myself, how can I love well? What does love look like? 
Now, love doesn't look like just agreeing with everyone. Love sometimes looks like confronting. Yeah? I ask myself, what opportunity do I have? There's many things that I could do, and I don't have the opportunity for many things. So rather than focusing on what I can't do, I just ask myself, what opportunity do I have here in this situation right now? And I ask the Lord, where are you moving? Show me where you're moving, because I just want to step in and move with you. And I just wanted to share two little examples from my week about that. And we've had a very fun week uh, with a family wedding. Ah, oh, weddings are so great. And my nephew got married. And my sister and brother-in-law are such wonderful parents. They have 11 children. And he is number three out of the 11. So there's going to be many more weddings to come, I'm sure. Um, and so we had quite a large group of our family travel to Palmerston North, where the bride's family are from, for a wonderful wedding. And I went with our daughter, Nevi. Some of you might know her. Um, we had a great time together. We booked into an Airbnb, and I chose it because I said, God, which one shall I choose? And I just felt that he said, choose that one there because the lady's got the same name as you. So... That's what I chose. <laughs> so we got there, and oh my goodness, it was the best Airbnb we have ever stayed in. The lady had made, I think it was eight different food items for us that were left waiting for us. It was so incredible. And I said to her, gosh, your hospitality is just like out of this world. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I said, I, you've got the same name as me. That's great. And she said, well, I, uh, my parents actually named me Jacqueline. And that's who I was known as for the first five years. And on the first day of school, I went there and the teacher said, what's your name? And she said, my name is Jackie and that's who I want to be known as. And I said, oh my goodness, that's exactly the same story. Because I was named Jacqueline and then I was known as Jacqueline for the first five years. And on the first day of school, the teacher said, what's your name? And I said, oh, my name's Jacqueline, but Jackie is going to be my school name. So I said, gosh, that's the same story. How amazing. <laughs> so that was really lovely to make that connection. And then, you know, she just looked at me and she said, you know, I'm a believer. And I said, oh, my goodness, that's exactly my story. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah. And we just had this really beautiful time. You know, she wasn't so connected to a church, but someone who's loving and serving God. And you can see it with the hospitality. So I just encouraged her that, you know, when people walk into her property, they experience the presence of Jesus. They experience his love, his extravagance, his care towards them. And whatever you're doing in your everyday life, people can experience Jesus just by meeting with you. Yeah, and then um, afterward, uh, then the next day we went to the church to set up for the wedding and I saw a lady doing the garden. So we just went over and said, hi, this is a really beautiful church. It had, uh, it was a, quite an old church. It had above the door 1875. I said, gosh, this church has been around here for ages. And she said, well, actually, no, it hasn't. I thought, oh, okay. She said, it may have 1875 above the door, but this church was moved here from another community in 1986. And she said, I've been in this community for a really long time, and I spent 20 years praying for a church to be here. And actually, the church is on, um, kind of reflects what was happening in that area. It was, it's on Moonshine Road. And then just up a little bit more, there's Whiskey, Whiskey Valley, and then there's a few others. So this whole area was used in the brewing of alcohol. And this lady came and prayed for 20 years for a church to be established. And the man who owned the piece of land was a farmer, um, who I think was involved in all of these activities in the local community. And um, God spoke to him and said, you need to give this piece piece of land for a church. So he said to this lady, here's the piece of land for the church. You can have it. And the lady said, oh, I better look for a church. So she looked up where people buy churches. I have no idea where that is. <laughs> so as soon as she looked there, she found a church for $3,000. And it was a little, this little country church that was established in 1875. Um, so they chopped it in half, put it on some trucks and moved it and put it there as a church for that community. And, um, you know, I just encourage you, if you've had something on your heart for 20 years or more, God is still going to break through. You may not have seen it, but you know it in your heart that God is doing something. 
I just encourage you, don't give up, have faith. I said to this lady, would you like me to pray for you? And she said, gosh, no one ever prays for me. (laughs) But I just encourage you, this is your day. Someone is standing alongside you and praying for you for the things that you have in your heart to do for the kingdom of God and his power and his love. And we can come alongside and stand and Jesus is coming alongside to stand next to you to see the breakthrough of his kingdom in your life and through your life. You know, as you uh, speak out of your identity and your authority, you should expect to see the kingdom breaking in. The kingdom will be breaking in all around you. You should expect to see it, especially as we move on towards the end of this age. We will see it more and more. That's who we are. We're people of breakthrough. And we read about this final breakthrough in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 13. It's headed, the heavenly warrior defeats the beast. And we know who those characters are. The heavenly warrior is Jesus, and the beast is Satan. And this is um, John's revelation. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And that's our Jesus. I love that about them, that he has a name written on him that no one knows. You know, Jesus doesn't need a name tag or a lanyard or a name on a door. He actually is who he is because that's who he is, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's wanting to come and establish you and who you are. You don't need a title to be loved by God because your title is the beloved. You don't need a title or a position or a certain position to be used by God because you are being used by him. And it talks about this in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 to 21. It's talking about um, the kingdom breaking in in the end. (laughs) On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, on the cooking pots in the Lord's house. Um, There will be will be like sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty. And you might feel just like a little saucepan, or maybe you're a big saucepan or frying pan, or maybe you're a wok. You can choose what you're going to be. Just an ordinary, ordinary everyday thing, yeah? But inscribed on you is holy to the Lord. That is who you are in Christ. That's how he sees you. You're set apart by him, loved by him, able to intervene with him in ordinary, everyday ways, but with the supernatural power and love of God. Now, as we start to think about this place that we are operating from, being seated in heavenly places, it, sometimes it does our head in, because we haven't experienced all of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's like that picket fence again. Sometimes we come against a barrier, And then sometimes we look through and we see the kingdom of God breaking in. Um, And so this year on our leadership track, we've been looking at what it means to live as the beloved, what it means to live in love, in God, in his love and in his kingdom, and how that differs from a life of fear, of trying and striving to be good enough or to be loved. And so I want to just finish up just with some statements, some love statements and some fear statements, just to contrast them in our thinking to do with the kingdom. Because whatever you believe determines the way that you think. How you think determines the way that you feel. And how you feel determines the way that you act. And so we can't just suddenly become people of faith. We've got to meet Jesus in every moment and become who we are in him and with integrity step out um, and act. So here's the first love statement. Um, This is true of you. I am involved in impacting the world through social transformation. Wow, sounds flash, doesn't it? (laughs) Social transformation, gosh. (laughs) That is who we are. We are people who are impacting the world through social transformation. 
And the fear statement is, this world is hopeless and there isn't anything I can do about it. Which actually might feel like it's true to us sometimes. You know, in some situations we feel like there's nothing that we can do about it. Yeah? But we know that God can do something about it. And we look to him. The second statement, the love statement is, I'm partnering with God and intervening in this present age. Because God is intervening, his kingdom is breaking in and we're looking and we're seeing and we're stepping in with how God is moving. Will we get it right all the time? Uh, no. Will it be perfect? Uh, no. Yeah? But we're just looking to see where he's moving and stepping in to join in with that. Um, the fair statement is, unless an intervention brings perfection, it's not worth stepping out which we can feel like is true, but it's not good thinking, everyone. It's never going to get you anywhere. (laughs) It's never going to be helpful because no one's going to be perfect. Even the most wonderful person in this life is not perfect. That's why our eyes must be on Jesus because he is the author and the perfecter of our faith for the future age. Yeah. So unless an intervention brings perfection, it's not worth stepping out. Or if you want to personalise it, unless I am perfect, I am not worthy of God using me to intervene. The next one, the love statement is, I'm present with the Lord as he is present with me and we are moving forward together, even through pain, suffering and failure. Um, yeah, there'll always be pain, suffering, and failure in this life. Yeah? And just because we experience it doesn't mean to say that we're a second class Christian. Everyone experiences those things because that's the time that we live in. But it's our opportunity not to get overwhelmed and taken out by it, but to stand in the midst of our pain and our worst moment and to raise our eyes up and to receive the Lord Jesus. So the fair statement is, my life should have no pain, suffering, or failure. Uh, Wrong, sorry. (laughs) Everyone's life will have pain, suffering, and failure. Oh, God help us. (laughs) Yeah. The next one is, a love statement is, I'm engaging with society and the things that are happening in my world. Sometimes the thing that's happening in our world can really make our head very sore. (laughs) But we need to engage with what's happening around us. And the fair statement is I must escape from society and focus on what's important for me. Which is true, some of the time we do need to take the time, yeah? But the point is that we would take the time to be revived so that we can step out and have an impact in this world. You may feel as if lots of things are hopeless, but with resurrection life in Jesus, there is always hope. If not in this age, certainly in the age to come. And the last one, The love statement is, Jesus is higher than any power or authority, and I am in Christ. Which is what we've been talking about today, hey. And the fair statement is, those in politics control my life. Which actually, to be perfectly honest, has been kind of true for a lot of us over the last few years, hey. With all the things that have happened, it is true that people in politics have controlled our life. But we, as the people of God can choose to have the thinking that Jesus is higher than any other power or authority. And it's not other people who are trying to control us. Um, So um, I, I just encourage you with those statements. You know, it's important for us to have our thinking based in love, based in being with the Lord and knowing who we are in Him. Um, because it's then we can step into what He has for us. Yeah.